Welcome. We are so glad you could join us for another Limpa Press webinar. During this time of social distancing, when we can't necessarily be in your offices in servicing you or visiting, it's really nice to be able to offer these educational seminars. And before we go any further, we want to thank you again and let you know how appreciated you are that you continue to take care of people during this very difficult time. Because of you, we're able to work together and continue to make life better for so many. So my name is Brenda Viola, and I am the marketing director for Medical Solutions Supplier. We are very proud to work with LymphaPress to provide this seminar as well as pneumatic compression devices that really make a difference in people's conditions. In fact, we have a very unique connection with today's topic because lipedema is a condition that affects 11% of the female population. And there's only one pneumatic compression device indicated by the FDA for the treatment of lipedema. And that's the LymphaPress Optimal Plus. We are so happy to be able to have a device that can offer hope and help to so many of these women with this condition. Before I get into introducing our esteemed guest today, a little bit of housekeeping. We have a disclaimer basically saying that the information transmitted during this webinar is for general informational purposes only. And now to the really fun, our wonderful expert today, who is Dr. Karen Herbst. She is the world-renowned doctor who is one of the foremost researchers and advocates for those with adipose tissue disorders. Dr. Herbst is going to present to us today on tools for lipedema during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are so thrilled to have you here today. Dr. Herbst, take it away. In fact, most women who have lipedema uh, have stage two. Earlier on, they, uh, they have stage one, and as they progress in age, or increase in weight, they can pro progress from stage one to stage two. And I think women with stage three lipedema are very unique and we need to understand them together with stage one and stage two, but also independently. And in these stages, you can see in stage one, the skin is very smooth uh, on the legs, for example, here. And this is a woman who works out all the time. She's um, got a lot of muscles. But under the smooth skin, there are these small nodules in the fat indicative of fibrosis. Stage two refers to how the skin and underlying tissue are changing. They have a mattress-like pattern. And again, this is uh, fibrosis in the tissue that is pulling the skin down. And then in stage three, you get much larger masses and you get lobulized uh, deposits. And it's at this stage where the risk for lymphedema is very high. This is a picture of a uh, fat tissue from a woman with stage three lipedema. And you can see all the little open circles here are fat cells. And in between the fat cells in this interstitial space or this new interstitial organ, there's pink tissue in addition to some blood vessels and also some macrophages. And this pink tissue is fibrosis. So with this slide, I just wanna show that in between the fat cells, there can be fibrosis, and then around fat lobules, there can be fibrosis. So the fibrosis is in different areas of the fat tissue. So lipedema tissue is not just fat. It has a high amount of fibrosis and also fluid, which we'll talk about in a minute. But it's this fibrosis in the fat that reduces the ability of women with lipedema to lose the lipedema fat after bariatric surgery. So women with lipedema who have obesity as well can lose the obesity fat after bariatric surgery, but the lipedema fat is much more resistant. And I think we need a lot more research in this area. This is a picture of a young woman who had bariatric surgery. So the picture on the left is pre-bariatric surgery and the picture on the right is post-bariatric surgery. And you can see she lost some abdominal fat quite nicely. And she also lost some fat on her calves but you can see that her thighs remained about the same. So this is where she holds most of her lipedema tissue. She also lost some fat on the arms, but you can also see that again, she retains a lot of lipedema tissue on the arms. So lipedema increases the risk for obesity, but obesity also increases the risk for development of 
more lipedema tissue. And obesity also increases the risk for the development of lymphedema, and this is very well characterized. So it may be that the increase in fat tissue in lipedema, whatever the cause, whether it's lipedema fat or fat from lifestyle-induced obesity or lipedema-induced obesity, increases the risk for lymphedema. When we looked at women by stage in my clinical practice, we found that a woman with stage three lipedema was more likely to have a positive Kaposi stemmer sign. And that's when you pinch up the skin. If there's fluid in the skin, then you, you can pinch up a large amount of tissue. If there's no fluid in the skin, you only pinch up skin. So there's no edema. So positive sign means there's more fluid in the tissue and you can see that increased by lipedema stage. So how does this fluid get in the tissue. Again, this is a picture of uh, adipocytes, and you can see this is the interstitial space here, and there are these fibers, which is connective tissue, or, or we call it fibrosis. There's also blood vessels, but you can see these white spaces, and we think that is fluid in the interstitial space. How does it just sit there within that interstitial space? Uh, Shelly Krasinski and her colleagues at Vanderbilt um, and I conducted a study at the Fat Disorders Resource Society meeting, and we found that extracellular water was higher in the fat tissue of women who had lipedema. So we do believe that, that it is true that, that this white space in here is fluid that is being held within the tissue. So with my postdoc, Sarah Godban, we looked at blood vessels in the skin and fat tissue of women who have lipedema. And we looked at them, um, whether they had obesity in addition to lipedema or they didn't have obesity in addition to lipedema. And you can see in either case, women with lipedema had higher amounts of vessels in the skin than women who did not have lipedema. So there is an angiogenesis going on, more blood vessels, more fluid entering the tissue. And when we looked at the tissue itself, you can see these unusual vessels that are coming out of the dermis up into this purple epidermis of the skin. And when you see a blood vessel of this structure, this is associated with diseases that have inflammation. So we think that these vessels, not only are there more of them that could be adding fluid to the tissue, but there's inflammation, which could allow an increased amount of leakage of fluid into the tissue. When we looked in the fat tissue itself, over 30% of the woman, women had some unusual structures of blood vessels. And it looked like an angiolipoma. So there are these lumens of blood vessels scattered throughout the tissue here. And this is an H&E stain. This is just a classic histology stain that we use. And then we stain with blood vessel markers, CD31 and smooth muscle actin. And you can see that we know that we're looking at blood vessels here. And then we stained with trichrome, which stains collagen. And so we're looking at blood vessels and collagen. So these unusual blood vessels, and in this case, dilated blood vessels, are present both in the skin and fat of women with lipedema. So if we look at blood vessels, as they come from the heart, you've got an arteri artery, arterial, and then we go down to the level of the capillary. And this is where fluid and nutrients are released into the tissue. There's also this post-capillary venule which is a very interesting micro vessel in that when you have venous disease and increased pressure in the veins, that pressure feeds back here and fluid can leak into the interstitial space. And also metabolites affect the leakage of fluid from the postcapillary venules and things like cytokines and histamine also increase the amount of fluid that leaves the postcapillary venule. So when I talk about micro vessels, I'm, I'm talking about the capillary bed and the venule. And we're not the only ones who think that perhaps the microvessels are important in, in leakage of additional fluid into the tissue. This is a paper from 1986 from France, and you can see this capillary here surrounded by fat cells, which are numbered, and you can see this little bit of leak around the capillary. If we look at the capillary uh, sideways, you can see that the capillary endothelium is very thickened, suggestive of inflammation and fibrosis. And when we look at the post-capillary venule, you can see that there are dilations. So again, I think the capillary and the post-capillary venule could be adding additional fluid into the interstitium. We just don't know exactly why. A couple of reasons why could be that there are increased 
vascular endothelial growth factor levels in women with lipedema, and this has been shown in, in one study, it needs to be repeated, and uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, induces the formation of leaky vessels. Not only leaky blood vessels, but leaky lymphatic vessels. And my postdoc and I were able to show that macrophages were higher in the skin and fat of women who have lipedema. And macrophages repair and inflame tissue. So you've got inflammation, you've got increased VEGF, potentially we have a microvascular leak. Again, not sure what the step is right before this happens. This is a mouse study showing red vessels here, you can see, and they injected these microspheres, which are white, and they leak out into the tissue when VEGF is injected, and this can lead to the development of edema. So I think that is one important factor going on in lipedema. We also know that women with lipedema have hypermobile joints. And again, more work needs to be done in this area, especially by people who are very familiar with testing women for hypermobile joints. But hypermobile joints could be a sign that there is a connective tissue disorder in lipedema. And connective tissue, again, is everywhere in our body. It's part of our, our, our body structure. It gives us our shape and our curves. And blood vessels are also made up of connective tissue. So having a connective tissue mutation could le lead to leakage from those vessels. And when we talk about connective tissue, we're talking about cells such as fibroblasts and chondrocytes in cartilage, osteoblasts and osteocytes in bone. But in fat, it would be just the fibroblasts. But there are also fibers, which I've mentioned collagen, but also elastin and other elastic fibers. And then there are these proteoglycans and glycoproteins, which I'll talk about. And then you've got your tissue fluid. So the, the word lipedema actually means fluid and fat. And this is under contention. There are some people who don't believe there's fluid in the lipedema fat tissue. And that kind of inspired this talk. And um, my colleagues on the Lymphedema and Lipedema Nutrition Guide, Emily Eicher, Linda Ann Kahn, Chuck Ehrlich, and I have been talking about like what is edema. And it's really interesting. It's very hard to define. You would think something as basic as edema would be completely definable, but it's not. So looking at the Merck manual, it, show, it stated that uh, edema is swelling of the soft tissues due to increased interstitial fluid. So we know that the fluid is somewhere in that interstitium. It could be generalized or local, and it results from one of the following. Increased fluid pressure in the capillary or the post-capillary venule. Decreased plasma proteins, which I've never seen in lipedema, so I don't think that's as important. Increased capillary permeability, which we've talked about, and obstruction of the lymphatic system, which we have not talked about, but which a lot of people are talking about. So here are the body fluid compartments. Fluid is either intracellular or extracellular. So intracellular within cells or extracellular. And we're gonna focus on extracellular fluid. So here's your capillary and here's your lymphatics and fluid moves from the capillary through the interstitium and out the lymphatic vessels. Within this interstitial space, there is collagen shown here. And that collagen binds to proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans forming a gel-like structure which bind up sodium. And then you've got your interstitial fluid, which is free flowing fluid, like you would see in lymphedema. And these blue blobs are albumin. And then you've got your sodium and your chloride. So what are proteoglycans? Proteoglycans are formed from glycosaminoglycans. And glycosaminoglycans are simply repeating sugar units. So for example, glucose and galactose repeating over and over and over, making a chain. And they covalently attach to core proteins making that proteoglycan. These glycosaminoglycans are highly negatively charged, which is essential for their function, which is binding sodium and also binding water. And these proteoglycans are found in all connective tissues. They're found in this extracellular matrix, this interstitial space, and on the surfaces of many cells. And they have the ability to bind up water and sodium, and they hydrate the tissue. And they actually give us our, our soft feel to our fat tissue. They also help us resist compressive forces. So when somebody grabs your arm, it doesn't go all the way down to the bone. And these uh, glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans also interact with collagen, which is really important. And that promotes the mechanical stability of our tissue. 
This is a picture diagram of what I've just talked about. So like glycans are in pink, and I think you can see the repeating sugar structures. They are bound to a protein forming this brush-like structure, which is your proteoglycan. These proteoglycans can bind to hyaluronin, which is also a glycosaminoglycan that is not bound to a protein core. And they form these huge proteoglycan structures, which bind up to collagen, and that gives this matrix some stability. Proteoglycans can also be membrane bound, and they are secre secreted by cells. And so I wanna focus on hyaluronin for a second. Um, hyaluronin is, again, as I mentioned, a unique glycosaminoglycan. It is found within the uh, interstitial matrix, and we hear about it in cosmetics. So one of the things that uh, cosmetics are used for is to hydrate our skin. And hyaluron, hyaluronin, or hyaluronic acid, as it's also known as, are, are a big part of the cosmetic industry. So we need to look into the research done in the cosmetic industry, I think, to better understand what's going on in lipidema tissue. So I'm gonna get down to a little bit of physics here. So this is uh, our triphasic model of interstitial fluid flux. And believe me, you will understand this when I'm done. So we talked about collagen before. This gives a stability to the tissue structure and fibroblasts bind to collagen molecules and hold them in place. This collagen surrounds the proteoglycan glyco glycosaminoglycan water sodium mix here, and then you've got your free flowing fluid. Fluid comes out of the capillary under uh, pressure, so here's pressure capillary, or it stays within a ca the capillary due to high oncotic pressure from increased amounts of proteins. But overall, the flux coming of fluid coming out of the capillary, so JV, must equal JL. So what comes out of the capillary has got to go back up unless it's bound up to these glycosaminoglycans here. The interstitial pressure, so the PI, is really important. And that the PI is equal to the pressure of the collagen here minus this oncotic pressure of the glycosaminoglycans. And everything we talk about in terms of the interstitial space pressure is gonna be relative. So I mentioned those fibroblasts hold on to those collagen fibers and help maintain the structure. If there's inflammation in the tissue, as we saw, for example, with macrophages, that inflammation can cause the fibroblasts to release their hold on the collagen matrix. And then that allows swelling to occur. So that fibroblast collagen interaction is super important. It's like a the fibroblasts are like trapeze artists, just kind of holding the, the collagen molecules so that they can slide around, but they can't uh, move apart from each other to allow the swelling. But if there's inflammation and they do move apart, then these glycosaminoglycans, hyaluronin, and proteoglycans take up the sodium and water and you get swelling or edema. And this is, I think, where we are with lipedema. And Shelly Krasinski and her crew at Vanderbilt showed that sodium content is elevated in the skin and subcutaneous adipose tissue in women with lipedema. So we have at least one marker that sodium is being held within the tissue. And if it's being held, it's likely held by proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans. I suggest them um, to understand the structure of the tissue more that you go onto uh, YouTube and look at the video Strolling Under the Skin by Dr. Gimberto, who is a hand surgeon. And you can see the collagen fibers here, and you can see these spaces here, and this is where the glycosaminoglycans reside. And Again, it is very much so like a gel. And one of the things we remark about when we examine women with lipedema is how soft and gel-like their tissue is. And that's why I think there is swelling here and more proteoglycans and glyco glycosaminoglycans in their tissue, binding up water and salt. One very interesting thing about uh, fat tissue, connective tissue, that I learned studying this fluid flux was that fat tissue can become very compliant. It can allow edema to occur. And I gave a talk a couple years ago at the Fat Disorders Resource Society meeting talking about how lipedema tissue is very compliant. And this is what compliance means. We're looking at interstitial fluid volume here, and we're looking at the pressure in the interstitium here. So when fluid comes out of the capillary, pressure in this interstitial area rises dramatically and exponentially just by putting a teeny tiny bit of fluid in. 
and that's to drive the fluid flux from the capillary and out the lymphatic vessel. It will rise up to a point where there's euvolemia. So you've got normal amounts of fluid in your inter interstitial space and you have normal amounts of fluid in your vessels. But if the amount of fluid in your vessels increases past euvolemia, then the connective tissue becomes highly compliant. And no matter how much fluid you put into the tissue, this pressure stays the same. It allows flow. And that is to protect that intravascular space. If we would allow fluid to stay within the intravascular space, it would be hard for the heart to pump more fluid into those vessels and the heart would be at risk for heart attack, our brain would be at risk for stroke. So the fact that our fat tissue is so compliant is really important because it is a protective mechanism for the body. So I think in lipedema, our body is protecting ourselves against excess fluid. And the fluid may not be entering as rapidly as shown here, but over time, I think women with lipedema are somewhere right here on the curve. There's a low pressure and it allows that constant chronic leak into the tissue, forming increased amount of proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans. This is a, a dog study um, from Dr. Guyton showing just what I showed you. They implanted a capsule within the connective tissue of dogs. They let the dogs heal up. You could even see there's blood vessels that have grown through the capsule. And this empty space here is in equilibrium with the interstitial space. You can't just stick a needle in here because the needle is much bigger than that interstitial space and you won't get accurate readings. But when they put, um, put the needle in here, they then put a blood pressure cuff on the dog's leg and blew the pressure up to about 60 millimeters of mercury, which is much less than what they build it up to when they take our blood pressure in it and it hurts. But that was enough pressure to cause congestion within the, the veins. And so the pressure arose dramatically and then it plateaus as edema develops. So again, our fat is a protective structure in our body. So our lipidema hypotheses are, there's increased capillary permeability and capillary filtration. So that's our JC, our, our flux out of the capillary, perhaps due to some sort of connective tissue mutation. There's also, in my opinion, increased prevalence of higher venous pressures. And this may be small venous disease, it may be large venous disease, that increases also fluid flux out of the capillary. There's increased glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans in the extracellular matrix, that interstitial space, giving a high oncotic pressure. And there's high compliance to the tissue and therefore lower lymphatic flow. And this excess fluid in lipidema makes fat grow. And it, this altered structure in the interstitium induces inflammation and eventually fibrosis. So I am put this into a, a, a very simple way to understand it, I think. So you've got your flux out of the capillary should equal your flux into the lymphatic. You have your glycosaminoglycans, your free flowing fluid, and your pressure of the collagen. If you increase the flux out of the capillary, you gotta increase the flux out through the lymphatic vessel. And that's just a normal state. And it should return back to a balanced state but I think in lipidema, it stays in this state. And over time, those glycosaminoglycans start to protect the body. They increase in amount, bind up to proteoglycans, bind up water, bind up salt, and you have um, then increased flux out of the capillary, increased flux into the lymphatic, but now you're building up this glycosaminoglycan structure in the interstitium, and that is, it not in balance with collagen anymore. Eventually, you develop fibrosis, more free-flowing fluid, and those lymphatic vessels undergo damage. And then a woman with lymphedema can develop lymphedema. We have some data that in lymphedema, this is what's happening. So this is a mouse model of lymphedema, not the best because mice can heal and get rid of their lymphedema, but uh, they cut circumferentially around the tail and then the tail swells, so there's lymphedema. And what happens? Boom, you get an increase in hyaluronin. And that reduces the flux out of your vessel and it increases the flux into the lymphatic vessel. And then there's a drop in this hyaluronin and the, there's some healing. But then the body, in order to protect itself, again increases the hyaluronin 
in order to uh, allow that fluid to flow out at a normal rate and hold on to whatever excess fluid there is until the body is ready to accept that additional fluid that's in the interstitial space. And in lipedema, I don't think this ever resolves. So how would you treat this? If you have increased fluid in your interstitial space bound up to glycosaminoglycans, what do you do and what can you do from home during this quarantine uh, with COVID-19? So the lo a low salt diet would be one thing to think about. So increased sodium ingestion results in enhanced capillary filtration. So that uh, flux out of the capillary and therefore more interstitial fluid flow. And this stimulates interstitial matrix production, in particular sulfated glycosaminoglycans, which are part of proteoglycans. So you're gonna, by um, increasing the amount of salt in the diet, you're gonna increase the amount of glycosaminoglycans. Now I know there's some uh, ladies out there who have um, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome who aren't going to be able to reduce salt in their diet. And I completely understand that this is just a suggestion. Also, we want to um, eat anti-inflammatory foods because we know that in lipedema there may be some inflammation. So if we avoid anti-inflammatory foods or in, avoid inflammatory foods like processed foods and eat anti-inflammatory foods, especially rainbow-colored fruits and vegetables, we may be able to help uh, reduce the formation of those glycosaminoglycans. We also want to um, avoid corticosteroids like prednisone. Uh, solumedrol, anything that you're taking in large doses, unless it's absolutely necessary. I know some women with lipedema have been treated with steroids because their doctors thought it might help, but it's really not a good idea because that decreases the pressure in the interstitium and allows more fluid to come in. Um, Anti-inflammatory supplements may be helpful. Some people don't absorb or respond to them, um, but two examples are diazomin, which comes from the rind of citrus fruits, and also vitamin C. And vitamin C, uh, in order to get enough absorption, you wanna take it in a lipophilic form or by subcutaneous injection or IV. And this has been shown to reverse that abnormal lowering of the interstitial space, allowing more fluid to come in. And we know that movement reduces the pressure in the interstitium, which is good, because the more we raise the pressure, then we're going to get into that compliant state and edema may occur. So when you anesthetize an animal, it's, the pressure in the interstitium is normal, around minus seven millimeters of mercury. And, but as an animal stays immobilized, that pressure starts to increase. So as they move the animal, then that pressure comes back down. So any movement is good for the interstitial space. We also know that external forces on the tissue improve the extracellular matrix. So the extracellular matrix, again, your glycosaminoglycans, your collagen, your proteoglycan around the adipocytes protects the cells from disruption. If you take pre-adipocytes, so the cell right before it's gonna become an adipocyte and you subject it to stretching, it will be less likely to go on to form a fat cell and store triglyceride. So these external forces change the cell to spend more energy on repairing and fixing that inter intercellular area rather than storing triglyceride. And these external forces can include compression garments, pumps, manual therapy, swimming, stretching, and other exercises. So uh, compression garments, I think that they reduce the flux of fluid out of the capillary. They increase the flux of fluid through the lymphatic vessel, so they maintain this interstitial pressure. Uh, pumps, I think really important to maintaining that um, interstitial pressure but also to reduce inflammation, to reduce that oncotic pressure of the glycosaminoglycans, increase that flux into the capillary, that, that uh, JL, and then maintain that normal interstitial pressure. There are certain vulnerable areas that you wanna be careful with when you pump. So there are areas that are highly compliant in the body and low pressure areas. That's the medial knee, around the elbow, medial elbow and right above the elbow, and then the inner thigh, and then the lower abdomen. So when somebody's using a pump, we don't wanna just put the pump on the lower part of the legs here, because that's gonna push fluid in here and in here. And on the arm, we don't wanna just uh, treat the upper part of the arm or the lower part of the arm. We wanna make sure there's contact of the pump between the entire elbow 
and the uh, pump circumferentially. And same with the knee, the pump has to wrap around the knee and come into contact with that knee to prevent fluid from just flowing directly into this area. So how can you maximize your pump? So things you can do at home before you pump that may help reduce these glycosamine and glycans, proteoglycans, and bound up water, whole body vibration, any kind of exercise, any kind of deep tissue treatment that you can do with your hands. And you can look, um, there's lots of sorts of um, deep tissue treatment. Obviously you wanna um, be careful and get some instruction, um, but a lot of ladies do this themselves. And so this is a little bit deeper than manual lymphatic drainage. There's tools that I've recommended, including gua sha tools, and you can buy them anywhere on the internet. Bouncing up and down, really, really good. So a lot of ladies um, use mini trampolines or just bouncing um, on while standing. Squeeze and release when you're squeezing your tissue and then release it, squeeze and release, that kind of acts like a pump. And that's uh, um, the basis of a lot of movements in yoga. And then there's the dead cat shake. And so the dead cat shake has been shown to improve the flow of lymphatic fluid very well. So you lie on your back, put your legs and arms in the air, and you give it a shake and just shake over time. I used to tell my patients, go in the bathroom when you're at work, raise your arms above your head and just give your whole body a shake. So anytime you shake your tissue, it helps move lymphatic fluid and then you just pump and it'll get even more out. Then you wanna put on your compression garments, you wanna put your legs up, you wanna lie prone, you wanna walk, uh, you wanna make sure that you prevent that fluid from re-entering the tissue. Uh, this is a hypothesis of mine that enzymes may decrease the, bi the, the uh, bind between glycosamine and glycan, proteoglycans and water and salt. And you can get enzymes from over the counter, there are tons and tons of them, or you can get it from your food. For example, uh, bromelain from pineapple, uh, there's also uh, enzymes in papayas, mangoes, honey, bananas. I re realize these are high sugar. For those of you on keto, you've got enzymes in avocados, sauerkraut, kimchi, miso, ginger. So lots of different ways to uh, in, potentially reduce that water glycosamine and glycan bind. And then you wanna use your pump on days that you eat lots of enzymes. And just referencing COVID-19, uh, they think there's a lot of thrombotic events that go on during COVID-19. And I think these enzymes actually um, decrease clotting. So my point is that these enzymes I don't think are going to hurt you during this time of COVID-19. So in conclusion, lipedema, I think has an edema. That's not the same as lymphedema. Lymphedema is likely a disease of increased capillary and post-capillary venule fluid flux into that extracellular matrix interstitial space causing a rise in glycosamine and glycans and proteoglycans that bind up fluid and sodium, eventually leading to lymphatic dysfunction and fibrosis. And there are a number of things you can do while you quarantine to improve lipedema tissue, including anti-inflammatory and enzyme-rich food, exercise of any kind, including the dead cat, compression garments, and of course, your sequential pneumatic compression pump. Thank you very much was amazing. Dr. Herbst, there is already a flurry of activity on the Facebook groups. There's so many lipedema ladies that are following you. You are giving so many people hope because you have cared enough to invest your brilliance into the condition. <laughs> and we have a host of questions. So okay. let's go to it because we know everybody's uh, got limited time here. First of all, the main question everybody asked is, can I get a link to this afterward? Because this was a lot of material It's too. a lot, and I apologize for that, but I really wanted to give as much information so everyone could think through it and digest it. And wonderfully, everybody's gonna get a link to this within 24 hours of today's presentation, so you can all look forward to that. I'm gonna go right through the questions. Barbara Conover, who is a recent patient of yours, has been recently diagnosed with cardiomyopathy. She was wondering aloud if there is a relationship between heart disease and lipedema? So there are a couple of papers out showing that the heart is different in ladies who have lipedema. And there, I'm, I'm not gonna pretend that I am a cardiologist at all, but the, the heart doesn't really pump, it actually twists. 
And so the twist mechanics were different in women who had lipedema and also the large vessel, the aorta that comes right out of the heart was different. So I think uh, it would be important for Barbara to get a hold of those papers that she could share with her cardiologist. And Barbara, if you send me an email, I can send you those papers. That's awesome. You know, we've all seen those commercials with Eva Longoria about hyaluronic acid. And our next question comes from Amanda Hathaway, who says, do lipedema patients need to avoid hyaluronic acid in their skincare products? No. Absolutely not. So we, you definitely want to keep your skin as hydrated and healthy as possible. The, the small lymphatic endings are in the skin. And if, and we need to keep, if you keep your skin healthy, then the chance of you maintaining that initial lymphatic function is high and very, very important. And I think we are just beginning to understand that there may be some problems with those initial lymphatics in the skin. So absolutely do what, do what you need to do to, to keep your skin healthy. And that includes keeping it hydrated, skin brushing is helpful, rolling um, the arms, um, you know, hands-on therapy, uh, whatever you can do, um, definitely important. So now Susie uh, Boshoff has a question about deep fascia massage to help break uh -huh. fibrosis. Do you recommend that? You know, I, would, I will say that we have some data showing that deep tissue therapy does help with lipedema. Uh, we definitely need larger studies in this area to, you know, finalize uh, whether or how important that is. I think for early stage lipedema, so stage one or stage two, I think it's very, very helpful. It is very painful when you start. And when we did the, um, a study on ladies with lipedema, they would curl their toes. And I, if any of them are listening, they're like shaking their head. And they also got more bruises. So there's a cost to pay. Is that cost uh, low enough to make that type of therapy relevant, important? And is it really gonna decrease lipedema tissue? Now we showed that it did decrease some fat tissue, but how much and for how long. So again, more work needs to be done in this area, but I think it's really important to keep the tissue help, healthy. And whether it's gonna, whether you have lipedema or not, I think women need to keep their fat healthy. That's one of our, it's one of our biggest organs in the body. It tends to get inflamed and it tends to get fibrotic. So I think deep tissue therapy done uh, where you work with a provider so that um, there's not as much pain and not as much damage to the tissue and everyone's different. Everyone can stand different um, pain levels. So I would just, I would be careful, but I would look into it if you were able to. And again, for women with stage three, there's so much tissue, how much really are we gonna do? And I think at that point, we have to look at other therapies to help women with stage three, um, including liposuction. Yeah. You know, that's a great follow-up question. Do you recommend liposuction in concert with pneumatic compression? Absolutely. So anything that you can do to improve, improve the lipedema tissue before you have the liposuction, I think it's important. And I've done some liposuction myself for research, and I was amazed at how fibrotic the tissue is. So if you can soften up that tissue prior to the liposuction, I think the chance of you getting a better result is, is higher. And I think working with a therapist who can do manual therapies, help you with compression, help you with uh, making sure you're making the right food choices because we're all human and making sure that you're staying active because again, we're all human and we all need support from each other, which is why this time is so difficult. Um, so I would, I would make sure you have a lot of support before and after you get liposuction, but it, yes, absolutely, improving the quality of the tissue, very important, and that includes use, use of pumps. I'm gonna read this next question verbatim because I don't wanna get it wrong. It's from Alessandra Lissini, and she says, first of all, doc, Dr. Herbst, thank you for the amazing lecture. Although you had mentioned the connective tissue hypothesis in previous research and talks, it now looks like we are clearly in the presence of a radical change of paradigm in the categorization of lipedema from a fat disorder, fat tissue disorder to a connective tissue disorder. 
How do you think this will change clinical practice and research and who is going to diagnose and treat lipedema in the future? Vascular specialists, dermatologists? As patients, who should we start lobbying into our cause? What a great and detailed question. Please have at it, Dr. Herbst. You have all day? So, you know, the, the definition of fat is that, that it's a loose connective tissue. So it, that is nothing new. And uh, it's just that we ignored it. And I still don't think we have the exact answer as to why the lipidema tissue forms. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? So did the fat come first and cause a disruption in the microvessels? and then the lymphatic vessels, or did the disruption in the, in the micro vessels come first, and then the fat grew after that? You know, I, I, I still don't have that answer. I don't know that anybody does. And so I think we're still in the learning phase. So again, I don't think this is anything new. This, you know, I've, I've been, um, I was working again with my um, colleagues who wrote the lymphedema and lipidema nutrition guide, and uh, Linda Ann Kahn was reading to me from the Kaisley Smith, Kaisley Smith textbook, and they knew about this back in, in the 90s. So and they knew about um, lipedema and glycosaminoglycan. So it's just that we haven't, you know, we, I, I wasn't privy to that. I, I've since ordered the book. I just ordered it last week or this week. I ordered it on Monday. So I, I think that we still are in the realm of fat vessels, connective tissue, and who takes care of, of ladies with lipedema? Everybody, everybody. So we, we mentioned earlier in a question that there are problems with the heart. We need cardiologists to help. There are problems in the skin. The skin can become amazingly thin and fragile, or it can become thick and fibrotic. Dermatologists would be helpful. Mm -hmm. I think women have um, basic needs. Primary care is really important. I think uh, with the increase in fat tissue and lipedema, the thyroid gets out of whack. Endocrinologists are important. Women with lipedema can develop metabolic syndrome. Again, endocrinologists are important. So I think we all need to share in the care of women with lipedema. Nobody can ignore lipedema anymore. The, our loose connective tissue is all over our body. It, it intercalates in between muscle cells. You know, I, I, I think that now um, everyone needs to wake up and start helping out and figuring this out so we can give women with lipedema better lives faster. And the patients, the lipedema ladies, and it's primarily a disease that affects women, their stories really touch my heart. And one of the questions that came through is from Elizabeth Cook, and this speaks to the genetic hereditary component to this. She says, I think my five-year-old daughter has lipedema, how can I help her not end up at stage three like me? Oh, yeah, so we are all fighting for our daughters. And you know, over time, research has neglected the study of women. And so the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, has pushed for more research uh, to involve women because we have been neglected. And I you know, look at my daughter and changes in her fat and I want to do something so I think, you know, we basically feed our kids carbs. Well, I'd be very careful with feeding our kids carbs. And there's, I've been looking into all unique ways of uh, eating keto and I'm a vegetarian, so it's difficult. But I have found things like uh, lupin, lupin flour, and which is mainly used in Australia. It's, it's a high carb legume flour, tastes great, works just like flour. You can make all sorts of different things. Um, so, so anti-inflammatory foods, low, lower salt, don't be salting things and show that you don't have salt at your table. Um, consider and keep your kids as active as possible. And I think we have to do something with manual therapy for our, our children when they're young. We don't do manual therapies where if, if you go to China, for example, they do manual therapies all their life. So somehow we have to change how we think about our tissue and it's okay for a child to get manual therapy, but which one, I really don't know. So I think um, teaching our, our kids that their fat tissue is important, it needs to be touched, it needs to be examined, things need to be moved through it. If you have a knot in your muscle, you work it out. If you have a knot in your fat, do you leave it? No, you work it out. 
and knots and muscles can be, or in fat can be worked out early. So I don't have all the answers for our kids, but that healthy diet, healthy exercise, and maybe um, having them wear some uh, sports compression, some really cool compression um, would be a good place to start. And swimming, 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 get our kids in the pool. Very, very important. Gotcha. We have a question about pump pressure. Is there a recommended protocol or is it on an individual basis according to tolerability? So I, that's something that I would love to work on is what is the best pressure for lipedema. I do think it's uh, going to be specific to pain tolerance and tissue texture and type. Um, a lot of times we just set things at 40 millimeters of mercury, but I think that it always is good to start low, go slow. And there's no rush. Once you get your pump, you can start at lower pressures and see how you do, see how you feel. If you say, I don't feel anything, well, then it would be time to move up. If you say, I feel too much here, or I feel too much pain there, then it would be time to lower the pressure and then look at that area and say, why does this particular area hurt? Gotcha. So are there any studies about lipedema fat growing back after liposuction? There are no studies on that per se, but I have surgeons who I have spoken to about this and I've seen it myself and I'm not sure we understand that. In fact, um, back in uh, the early 2000s, I was talking to Stefan Raproch about this and he's a liposuction surgeon in Germany. And he asked me like, why do women's boobs get bigger after liposuction? And it, it seems like there is a, a fixed amount of fat that your body wants to keep on it. And that would be like a fatostat, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that's the whole answer. And I think that again, I, I said with bariatric surgery, we need a lot more research on ladies with lipedema. We need a lot more research on liposuction for ladies with lipedema, especially here in the United States. There's been a lot of research in Germany, but not here. And I think we have a different population and we have a different healthcare system. So it needs to be studied, but I do think it's a risk. I just am not sure it's a risk in everybody. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who to counsel that it could happen to and who to counsel that it wouldn't. So again, more research is needed. And the surgeons are, are all on board. They want to do this research. Excellent. We look forward to that. We do have some live callers who would like to ask you a question. And Dr. Thomas Wright will be our first question. Dr. Wright, thanks for being with us today. Please have your have at it with your question. Well, I I, I just uh, want to congratulate uh, Dr. Herbst on on an amazing talk, and um, and I would like to um, you know. Uh, what a, what a great great presentation! Really really gets gets you thinking. Um, you know, I I have a question about COVID and uh, and lipedema. Um, and are ladies with increased um, with co are ladies with lipedema at increased risk for COVID infections? Mm -hmm. So um, I should have mentioned Tom. Um, so Tom and I have been talking a lot and. If you go to Tom's website, um, there's actually a, a Zoom talk that we had about ladies with lipedema and their risk for COVID. And I, I've been thinking a lot about it even since we've, we've had that discussion. And I think a woman who just has lipedema is not at increase, increased risk for getting COVID. I think she has the same risk as everybody else in the population. But if a woman with lipedema develops obesity and inflammation, and I think her risk goes up just like other people who develop obesity and inflammation. With that said, I was thinking of this uh, coagulation aspect of COVID and they just showed um, that uh, lupus anticoagulant can be present in the blood of people who have lipidema or people who have COVID, coronavirus infection. So I think that you know, unfortunately with venous disease, there are these small little clots that form in the small venules that drain the veins. And so, you know, if, if a woman with lipedema especially has venous disease plus obesity, I think that's probably um, would increase her risk, you know, and I don't know how much uh, of developing um, an infection 
So I, I, I'm just trying to think of all the possible risk factors that could do that. And so I think obesity and venous disease and especially inflammation and fi fibrosis within the tissue, all of that's going to add just little increments to that risk factor. I don't know, Tom, what you think about that? I, I think that's a great, great start. Uh, we're, we're learning so much um, about COVID and we are, and it and 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 its role in um, in coagulation is really just being and, and blood clots is just being uh, discovered. So, thank yeah, you. thank you, Doctor Wright, for calling in. We appreciate your question. We also have another caller, Kathy Pavkin, and we'd love for you to ask your question of Doctor Herps as well, Kathy. So I'm not hearing her right now. Perhaps her phone is muted. So I'm going to go to another question from my new friend who has a great Facebook group. It's amazing how the lipedema ladies find each other and they find their tribe and they find hope and support on Facebook. Cheryl Scollage is one of those ladies and she is focused on food intolerances and how it relates to lipedema. She says, we've been getting mixed messages on salt add sea salt to keep electrolytes up, but then we hear low salt and research showing sodium being trapped in lipedema fat cells. So do you recommend staying away from salt or is a salt-free diet too extreme? You know, salt-free diets are very, very difficult. So I think a nice balance would be that we get enough salt in our food, it would be not adding that extra salt at the table. So you want, you definitely want, I mean, we are, we are watery creatures. I think that the, the talk today shows we are loaded with water and we are loaded with electrolytes like, like sodium chloride that comes from salt. So I, I just think um, everything is balanced, everything with balance. And I think if we completely eliminate salt from our diet, we are eliminating one of the joys of life. So you know, I think avoiding high salty foods like um, soups that you buy from the store tend to be high salt, make your own and try not to add salt. You can let people add their own salt or their own flavorings to the soup. Um, but I, I think we get enough salt um, in, our, in our daily food. It's just don't add more. Don't load yourself up with salt, like eating, you know, really salty popcorn every night or um, salting your edamames too much, you know. Um, I'm, I, I definitely don't want to push you away completely from salt because salt gives us the flavor to our food that we love, but just be balanced. Balance, that's great advice. Kathy Combs wants to know if there are any connections between lipedema and PCOS. As an endocrine specialist, you might be in a good place to comment. She's often thought that they might be reacting off of each other, high hormonal reaction, et cetera. So I, I do have a few ladies who have polycystic ovarian syndrome and lipedema, but I don't think it's, um, I don't think they are intimately linked for all women with lipedema, but when they occur together, that combination greatly increases the risk for developing obesity, metabolic disease, and diabetes. So I do think that they, they then start to play off each other and not in the best way. And it's one of, one of the things I look for in ladies who have lipedema is what, what is their metabolism? How are they doing? What are their fasting insulin levels? What is their fasting glucose levels? How do those two things interplay with each other? Are they at risk for developing metabolic syndrome? Whereas a woman with PCOS is, is almost already there. So I think women with, with lipedema and PCOS um, need to be very careful and, and should be working with an endocrinologist or a gynecologist who is uh, dedicated to helping them with their PCOS and hopefully know something about lipedema too. Mm -hmm. There would be no way for us to get through the open 47 questions in queue right now. So I'm gonna to try to consolidate some of them in the hopes of answering as many as possible. They're all wanting to know how they can make you their doctor. Are you setting up a private practice that they can connect with you? That's honestly one of the most common questions we're getting here. Uh, you'll get a lot of information after this session and links and resources 
And certainly you'll keep hearing from Dr. Herbst. And Dr. Herbst, we hope we can have you back to answer even more questions in the future. If you were to provide a gold standard of care for lipedema, what would that be? I would be diet and exercise, number one and two. So making sure that whatever food you're eating, and I, I support keto and non-keto alike. Um, so I had the RAD diet way back in the day, and then you know uh, keto has worked for a lot of my ladies. So any kind of healthy eating, very important. Definitely got to have movement. If you can swim, that's super. If you just got to do the dead cat, I'm all right with that. And then compression garments, I think are really important because right now we can't stop the leak. We don't know how, you know, if there is this leak. So um, I think wearing the right kind of compression, if you can wear it, you know, if, in Arizona, it's really difficult to wear compression during the summer, but within reason. And then um, swimming is like top of my list. You, you, you gotta swim if, if you can. Pools aren't open right now, we're stuck. So you gotta think of how you can take care of yourself at home. And I think the best substitute would be to have a pump. And I think that really empowers you to mechanically stimulate the tissue at home. And it's the easiest way to do it. And I tell my ladies, if you are in the pool, you don't really need to use your pump because your tissue is, is doing so well. But if you can't get in the pool, you should use your pump. So right now, I think, um, I think we should all have a Zoom, like a 500 lipedema ladies on Zoom, and we should all be in pumps. I think it's and a great idea. To talk about it. I'll be glad to help organize that one. I absolutely love it. We can't thank you enough, Dr. Herbst. We want to be respectful of everyone's time. We know we're running out of time. We did mention at the start that the Optimal Plus by Lymphopress is the only pneumatic compression device that is indicated for the treatment of lipedema. And lipedema ladies, we know you're out there and we want you to know we care about you. We want to work together with the amazing therapists and clinicians and, and doctor's offices that are also online with this webinar today, linking you together to give you some hope and some help. We can't thank you enough, everyone, for being with us today. And be safe, be well, and we'll see you in a couple weeks for our next webinar. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.